Hello, my name is Kim Eagle from Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I'm joined today by Deepak Bhatt from Boston. We're delighted to provide you coverage today for ACC.org on a number of key trials that are being presented today, Friday, uh, November 13th at the American Heart Association meetings. This is the 2020 version and it's all virtual. We have a lot of trials to cover and they, they affect things like uh, diabetes care, heart failure care, cardiac arrest. There's a polypill study, uh, a new drug for, for heart failure. Uh, it's a very exciting meeting and we're happy to give you some of the highlights. So I'm gonna start with a study called Galactic Heart Failure. Uh, and this is a study of a new drug. It affects cardiac myosin. It activates cardiac myosin. And this is a study of over 8,000 patients randomized to three different doses of this agent or a placebo and followed for a period of several years. Uh, the study suggested that this new agent might reduce hospitalizations for heart failure. But looking at the more troublesome endpoint like cardiac death, uh, there did not appear to be a benefit, which was a bit of a surprise because uh, the markers suggesting benefit in physiology were favorable. Deepak, what did you think? I actually thought it was a pretty scientifically important trial. Obviously, I realized the relative and absolute risk reductions were modest. But nevertheless, it's a totally new way to treat heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And I'm happy to see this novel mechanism of action work. And the fact that it's enhancing contractility, to me, that maybe would have been expected to influence endpoints like cardiovascular death, but that's also a lot to ask for when there's so many other effective therapies these days that do that for heart failure. So uh, I was really uh, impressed. Uh, again, I realize it's a modest effect. It'll be a new drug. Uh, possibly expensive, but uh, scientifically, uh, I thought really a home run. Uh, one of the good news facts of this trial is that it did not appear to increase the risk of arrhythmic death. And we've, <laughs> we've had such a, a trail of bodies, if you will, in the inotropic space with heart failure. Uh, that certainly was a good signal for us. Yeah, and overall, the safety profile looked pretty good, thinking about things like potassium or kidney injury. So Again, assuming that you know the price isn't uh, totally prohibitive, and assuming it makes it through regulatory approvals, I think it's another option, and we need more options in heart failure. I agree. And staying with the theme of heart failure, have you um, tell us about the Affirm HF trial? An interesting study. Oh, absolutely. This was yeah another heart failure trial. The idea was giving patients intravenous iron, and it turned out that at least the way I interpret it is that it was effective and supports the concept in anemic patients uh, who've got heart failure to go ahead and correct their iron levels. Now, one can quibble about different p-values, whether they were significant or not, but the overall trial came close, but didn't quite hit. But this trial, like many uh, that we're going to hear about, I think in the next several months, uh, was a casualty of the COVID pandemic. So. You know, I, I think you've got to give them a little bit of grace period there in terms of the p-values and so forth. I think it's a hypothesis that made sense. And as far as I'm concerned, they did validate it. So in patients that have marked anemia, I would say it would have been a good idea probably to correct that for a variety of reasons, but certainly if they've got heart failure in particular with reduced ejection fraction, go ahead and treat that low blood count. Yeah, certainly if you think about some of the studies that have looked at anemia after bypass surgery or PCI, we, we haven't necessarily seen that correcting anemia is always uh, going to be associated with a better endpoint. But this trial certainly suggests in heart failure that there may be a positive sign. Yeah, and I think it depends to how you do it. Transfusions haven't been shown to be useful per se. So you know that, that's a, a different type of approach. Uh, erythropoietin inducing agents haven't shown any benefit, some signals of harm when just given routinely to asymptomatic patients with kidney dysfunction. So this is a little bit different of a population than those studies and a different approach giving iron. Absolutely. Let's move on to uh, vital rhythm. You know, we, we've seen in the last few years that prevention is a key for treating atrial fibrillation and probably is a key for preventing it. Uh, so why wouldn't uh, agents like uh, omega-3 fatty acids or vitamin D potentially have a benefit in preventing AFib in high-risk individuals? 
And this study was a big one, 25,000 participants who were randomized two by two to omega-3 or uh, vitamin D. And they were followed out for, three point, or for five years, actually. Uh, and unfortunately, there was absolutely no effect, um, perhaps because you know, the real benefit of prevention, lowering blood pressure, uh, maybe reversing or reducing sleep apnea, reducing obesity and some of the consequences of that. Uh, but it looks like the simple solution of taking pills to prevent AFib, vitamin D, omega-3 probably doesn't work. What are your thoughts? I agree with them you said. I think these are more data really that patients don't just take supplements, whether they're omega-3 fatty acid supplements, whether they're vitamin supplements, you know, unless there's some indication for that type of nutritional supplementation, there's really just no evidence it works. So it's a waste of money. And you know, if you the vitamin D part looked like it was just uh, totally null, but if you look at the omega-3 part and go down a little bit more deeply, patients are actually on treatment, you know, there were even some potential trends towards more atrial fibrillation, not statistically uh, significant, but numerically. So uh, no demonstrable benefit of these sorts of uh, supplement doses of omega-3 fatty acids or the vitamin used here. So I'd simplify patients' regimens. If they come in, as they often do on a bunch of supplements and vitamins and other stuff, I just say, look, stop taking this, uh, take the prescription generic stack I'm trying to get you to take. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I found the, um... The ARREST trial to be really interesting. Uh, obviously, this takes a lot of resources, but tell us about this strategy for out of hospital cardiac arrest. Yeah, absolutely. I, I found the results well arresting. It was really a great trial. <laughs> it was a small study, uh, but nonetheless, the effect size was large and I think believable. And as you said, it's out of hospital cardiac arrest. So, though specifically, ventricular fibrillation. So this isn't just anybody with a random out of hospital cardiac arrest, but it's with, uh, you could say, refractory VF. And in that sort of situation, uh, the institution of ECMO produced dramatic results in terms of actually surviving to hospital discharge and even beyond. So I think these data will likely be enough to convince most people, some healthcare systems, maybe many healthcare systems, that there's merit in this approach. It makes sense, you know, VFib, unlike say pulseless electrical activity or so forth, you know, oftentimes can be corrected if there's just enough time to marshal resources, if it's an occluded artery, open it up. So uh, I believe the results and I think they're important. Yeah, I think an important part of the study was the notion that these were survivors who um, gone through three shocks, I believe. They were put on an automated CPR machine that guarantees effective CPR. And I believe they had to be within 30 minutes of transfer to a facility that could do this. So this is not for everybody. Uh, and it's using a CPR tool that has been proven to be highly effective. Uh, but this may become uh, the standard therapy in the future for at least a cohort of our patients who have out of a hospital cardiac arrest. Yeah, I agree with you a thousand percent. Again, that's why I mentioned uh, that uh, some healthcare systems will adopt it because it's not necessarily a trivial thing to institute an ECMO program, let alone ensure that all those other components of pre-hospital care are in place. It takes a very organized, well-financed healthcare system to do that. But I think in such countries and regions where that's possible, why not institute this sort of program? It gives these sorts of patients a shot. Yeah. Yeah, we'll look for more. This is a very novel approach, I think. Um, Moving on, so, so TIPS3 uh, is, an, is a wonderful study looking at the potential role of a polypill. And of course, in, uh, in areas of the world where resources are more constrained, perhaps, uh, the notion of a polypill to really help manage diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, and at-risk patients has a lot of uh, uh, obvious merit. And this, this study was uh, very interesting. That, the poly pill had what, simvastatin 40, atenolol 100, hydrochlorothiazide 25, and then a dose of ramipril. And it randomized patients to the poly pill or placebo. They were high risk patients based on a risk scoring system and then followed. And, and the risk reduction was about 20% in endpoints that matter. So uh, the, the notion I think has been proven um, and I was a little surprised at the dosing, but I think uh, you have to treat the, the problems, right? There was a 20% drop in LDL, I believe, and about a six point drop in blood pressure. 
Uh, and if you don't move those measures, you're not going to move endpoints. Uh, I love the study, and uh, it, it could be a harbinger for the th things to come. What do you think of this trial, Deepak? I'm with you completely once again. I, I thought it was a terrific study. And I think, at least for certain healthcare systems, certain regions of the world, it can make an enormous difference. I think that the risk reductions are believable because if you're treating multiple risk factors at once, that's the sort of effect sizes you'd expect to see. So I, I think there's really merit in this approach. And these are all generic medicines in terms of the components there. So I, I don't know ultimately what this type of polypill would be priced at, but I believe the whole idea is that it be priced cheaply so that it can be deployed in these sort of poor regions of the world. So to me, it, it, it's really a major advance conceptually, but could also have a lot of practical implications from a public health perspective. Yeah, if you imagine the global impact of polypill therapy in places that right now have nothing, uh, it's absolutely massive to think about. And uh, I, I really hope this strategy takes hold, particularly in places where patients are, are not offered uh, therapy at the current time. Totally agree with you. And just before someone writes this uh, nasty letter to the editor or something, it just doesn't in any way diminish the value of lifestyle modification. Uh, obviously, uh, we and these investigators and everybody are big believers in that. But uh, the reality is when people have multiple risk factors or high cardiovascular risk in general, that that's oftentimes not sufficient to reduce cardiovascular risk. Yes, and, and if you're in a resource-constrained area, the ability to have close follow-up and continue to coach and encourage weight loss and, and you know typical things we try to do to reduce blood pressure, salt restriction, et cetera, uh, not only are you restrained in terms of pharmaceuticals, you're often restrained in terms of what else you can offer in terms of follow-up, nutrition, consultation, et cetera. Absolutely, I mean, if it's a resource port, place, there's uh, not, not access to healthy food, there's a lot of preserved foods, high in salt that are being eaten, difficult to just directly modify that if it's a societal level problem. So for sure, I think this approach is complementary to attempts at lifestyle modification. You know, uh, Deepak, I continue to be amazed at the potential value of the uh, SGLT2 inhibitors uh, and other agents that he, they emerged out of the diabetes world, but they're affecting things that really matter beyond diabetes. And there's two studies today that I thought were interesting. One of them is DAPA HF, the other I think was Emperor Reduced. Tell our audience about these two really important studies. Yeah, again, just a great bolus of data, even British TV got thrown in there. So there's just lots of data coming out from these completed SGLT2 inhibitor trials. It seems like every cardiology and nephrology and diabetes meeting, there's an additional subset or subgroup or secondary analysis. And the messages are pretty consistent. It really shows benefit for this class of drugs in a broad range of patients. In patients with diabetes, especially those with heart failure, with reduced ejection fraction, especially those with chronic kidney disease. But also we're learning now from DAPA CKD and Emperor Reduce in those patients without diabetes, but who have chronic kidney disease or heart failure reduced ejection fraction respectively. And the effect sizes are pretty large. I mean, in DAPA CKD, the initial results is published in the New England Journal of Medicine rather recently, I thought looked spectacular. But now this analysis looking at those with or without cardiovascular disease, consistent benefits. So it's not just a diabetes drug. It's not just a cardiology drug. It's really a drug class that should be deployed pretty broadly, again, in those with diabetes, but even in those without di diabetes that have either CKD or heart failure reduced ejection fraction. And the overall safety, pretty good. Yes, absolutely safe. It's not for type one, of course, diabetics, but the hazard ratio, you know, is in the, the, the 60 percent, 70 percent, so 30 to 40, 50 percent reductions we're seeing. These yeah. are agents that our audience should be using uh, in both diabetics and not, who have high cardiovascular risk, especially those with heart failure reduced or preserved, and in patients with hypertension and reduced uh, cardiac or renal function. Yeah, I agree, though. Uh, strictly speaking, the data for heart failure preserved ejection fraction is yet to come. 
Um, we haven't uh, seen too much in the way there, but so heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, I think at this point, the data are pretty clear. Uh, there's DAPA HF, and, and as we were just reviewing, uh, Emperor Reduced, so two separate trials showing the benefits there. As well, some of the data from Emperor Reduced this time shows benefits in quality of life, the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire. So it's not just that patients are showing up to the hospital less with cardiovascular and renal complications, they actually feel better too. So that's an important part of delivering good patient care, not just making sure that they're staying out of the hospital or potentially living longer, but also feeling better. Great. Well, we've covered a lot. Uh, this is a great day for important trials that I think are informative to our practices. I wanna thank you for listening to our acc.org wrap up of uh, Friday, uh, November 13th, 2020 from the National Scientific Sessions of the American Heart Association.